Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 285. Someone needs to do this. And finally, I'm like, hey, why don't you do it? Attention, gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and I'm so happy that you're joining me here today. First up, a quick announcement about the new Facebook shops. I did a challenge in my Facebook group, Gift Biz Breeze, a few weeks ago now. Well, maybe it's even been a month to get people up and running on this new platform. It was so exciting to see current business owners open another channel for money to flow into their business. And also, new makers getting their first sales ever. Based on all the feedback I received, I've now turned this challenge into a mini course. If you've been thinking about making money from your handmade products, but haven't formally started a business yet, you definitely want to check this out. The holidays are coming, so it's the perfect time to have some of those gifting dollars come your way. Get more details at giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash Facebook shops. I'm so excited to get you over to the show today. You're going to hear from a retail store pro. Remember those things? Brick and mortar shops? Anne is on her third, so I think we can call her a pro. You'll hear her journey from one shop to another and what she's learned along the way, including how she identifies the products to carry in her store, what led to private labeling of her own line of products, and the single strategy that led to getting into Total Wine, Whole Foods, and airport shops. And she did this pretty easily. Make sure to stay until the end when she shares where she's headed next. Nope, not another store. Something even bigger. Stay tuned. I am so excited to introduce you today to Ann Mitchell of So El Paso. After opening and selling one retail store in Austin and then another in El Paso, It's fair to say that Anne has a good grasp on the retail landscape in Texas. What she realized during that time was that there were no items available to represent El Paso. You see, she's a fourth-generation El Paso Texan and takes great pride in having attended Texas A&M during five successful football seasons in the Southwest Conference. Yay for that! (laughs) But not being able to stock products representing El Paso simply wouldn't do. Enter So El Paso, her current venture, which began in 2015. It's now grown into a retail, wholesale, and internet business offering a line of gourmet products, including salsas, jams, nuts, and more. Anne, welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Wow, thank you. That was a nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot going on in your intro, and we're going to get into some of that what you shared with me earlier. We're going to talk about that because I want to get to exactly how you got to So El Paso. But before we do that, I know you're a listener to the show, so you know what's coming. I do. It's the candle question. If you were to share with everybody a vision of you through a motivational candle, what would it look like by color and quote? Well, I'm not very creative, so I'd probably copy my favorite candle, which is Rewind out of Charleston, South Carolina. And they're made out of wine bottles, recycled wine bottles. And they have wine scent. So mine would probably be a Merlot. And the motivational quote would be, which is my go-to motivational quote, is the view only changes for the lead dog. But then I'd add on the back, because there's a wine candle, I'd probably add work hard, play hard. Love them both. (laughs) Tell me more about the view only changes for the lead dog. What does that mean? Well, it was a family friend of ours, Mr. Gunny, and I mean, I must have been in sixth grade when I heard this, and I was like, holy cow, that totally makes sense, because the dog behind me is looking at, obviously, my buttocks, 
And who wants to go through life doing that? So to me, the view only changes for the lead dog. You've got to keep pushing and keep going and make sure that everything is new and exciting in front of you and not just the same old, same old. When I was thinking of that, I was thinking, well, when you're the lead dog, there's no one in front of you. So you're making your own way, which I kind of like, too. Yeah, that makes sense, too. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. So you can look at it from both ways. (laughs) From both sides. You don't want to be looking at someone else's rear end, (laughs) but much better to pave your own way in the future, maybe. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) Love it. All right. So super curious, Anne, because in your intro, so Gift Biz listeners, when I have a guest on the show, I ask them to give me a little bit of an intro, but then I'll improvise on it too. But you have some interesting experience before you started into your own businesses. So share with us a little bit more about that. I graduated from Texas A&M in 1987, and Texas was pretty much in the tank. So I upped and moved as the lead dog to Phoenix, Arizona, and I was doing some temp work. And they called and said, hey, we have a job with Apple Computer as a training coordinator. And I'm like, sure. Oh, no, I think I started with the education group. And that was what I did. I'm like, sure. I think it was like six fifty an hour. And I went there and just the whole, it was the Phoenix sales office. So it was just, everyone was outgoing. And I mean, it was awesome. Great place to work. And I was answering the phone. Here I am with a finance degree. I'm like so excited. I'm making six fifty an hour. Another position came open and they said, the temp agency said, usually when people go in as temps, they end up going permanent because this office is really growing quickly. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I was just happy to have a place to get up and go every day. Well, and a nice business to be going to, of course. It was a great time during Apple. So I started there and then I ended up getting a permanent position within like two weeks. And then it was Christmas and I got two weeks paid vacation and I had health insurance. I was like, holy cow. This is looking really good right now. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't have that good of grades in college, which my husband will laugh at. So I just kind of landed in, at Apple and I just worked hard and they had this huge copy machine and it was brand new and no one knew how to use it. And so I just became the copy queen. I was like, I know how to use the copier and everyone would have to come to me because I knew how to use the copier. So it was really a fun time. And I had this great experience and we moved into a big high rise and it was a great time, good money. They would give bonuses every quarter because the company was doing so well. This is Windows was just starting to come out and the training department and we called Windows Tammy Faye Doss because it was just Doss dressed with bad makeup. So (laughs) it was kind of a cocky time at Apple, which is they're still cocky. But Sue, I'm sad to say that I had Apple stock at $50 back then. Oh, my. I sold it. (laughs) No, you didn't. Oh, I did because it started tanking. And oh, I thought I needed some money at the time, which dumb. Oh, well, don't look back. Only look (laughs) forward, right? (laughs) Yeah, but it was a great time. My first real manager lived, he was in Orange County. And his advice to me was it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Mm -hmm. and just let me go. So I did what I did and just moved on. And it was a great company to work for. What kind of skills do you feel you picked up from there? There, it was really just make it happen. I mean, there was not a lot of micromanaging. There was a a lot of trust put in the employees and it was just do it until we tell you you're doing it wrong. And that was great for me because we were kind of creating this little training department and giveaways and how we were catering. And no one really was looking over my shoulder. I was just doing it. And I thrived in that environment because that's just what it did. But I think that's probably the biggest thing I got. And then they treated their employees so well. We would go to basketball games and there was always something going on. There was a T-shirt for every occasion. It was just they treated the employees well and do your job. Well, that's a great mindset to start acquiring, I think, right as you're starting out, too, in the workforce, is not being afraid of trying things and just being able to be free in what you're going to work towards. Because so many people, they have people who are hovering over them, micromanaging 7,000 layers of approval for anything. But for you to be able to have that freewheeling, let's try it, let's see it, let's create things and move forward without a lot of limitations is kind of a great mindset as you move forward, as I'm just observing where you went from here. And I ask that question because there are a lot of people who are listening who are in corporate jobs right now or some type of work. And I keep wanting to drill down to the point that there are things that you can be learning that can help you as you grow later with what you're doing right now. Sure. So there was that and there was some more computer experience within your realm, right? But let's just jump forward because I know there's so much to talk about with So El Paso. Where was the turning point or how was it that you decided that you were going to jump ship working for somebody else and create something for yourself? When I lived in Austin, I was working for a software company. I was traveling all over and it was just 
really exhausting. And my mom gave me this quote that said, don't sacrifice yourself on the altar of someone else's success. That really hit me hard in the gut because I was like, gosh, I'm working so hard for someone else. And it was good, but it just was not really that fulfilling. So I just quit. I said, I'm done. And I had taken a Johnson O'Connor test when I was 16. It's like an aptitude test and tells you what you're good at. And they had told me, oh, you like big picture. So you should stay in the big picture, but you're also good with numbers. So you could have your own business and do your finances. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that was always in the back of my mind because I had worked at a Papagallo shop back in my high school days. And I really liked retail. So I thought, you know, what the heck, I'm going to go for it. And we had a family friend here in El Paso that was making furniture at a tobacco barn wood from Tennessee. And I fell in love with it. And I thought, I'm going to open a store outside of Austin and sell this furniture. So that's where it all started with this tobacco barn furniture and home accessories. And it kind of grew into the typical Texas cow skin rugs and horns and limestone lamps and that kind of thing. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And then my husband, actually, we got engaged and married and he actually quit his job and we ran the store together. And it it was really a lot of fun until the guy who made the furniture wanted to retire. So we bought the furniture manufacturing company that was in El Paso and we moved to El Paso right at the same time I was pregnant. And we thought we would do both the manufacturing and the retail store, and that just didn't work. So we ended up selling the retail store in Salado, Texas, and then doing just the manufacturing. So then I stayed home for a little bit. I got bored. I'm like, ugh, so bored. And there was not a full service baby store in town. So I opened that called Duck Duck Goose, and that was a ton of fun. I mean, everyone was happy and, oh, it's my first grandbaby, or I finally have a girl, or it was just a really, really fun shop, really upbeat and registries, and it was a lot of fun. And then I ended up selling that. I had a hard time getting pregnant. I finally got pregnant with my daughter through in vitro. And at the same time, my 15-year-old niece had died of cancer. And so here I'm working this business, and I'm like, why am I working? I tried so hard for this baby. And I have her and my niece died. My life is short. I just decided to close up the store. I'm like, I'm done. My lease was up. I'm done. There's got to be more of the life than this. And I ended up selling it. So that turned out to be a nice thing. It's amazing how you're so driven towards one thing and life events then can reallocate priorities because it's so easy to just focus so much on something that you're building. Absolutely. Take me back or try and remember when you were first getting into retail. You had experience because you'd worked at another shop, but not owning your own retail store. What types of things for somebody who might be thinking of starting up, it might sound crazy in this time to even be asking this question, but I do see people seeing an opportunity in brick and mortar retail shops today. What types of things do you wish you would have known before you got started? or advice you would give to somebody today who's thinking of opening a retail shop? Well, all three of my stores are very different. I'll just take So El Paso. I mean, trade shows are key. And I know it's COVID and all that. But I mean, just going and really knowing that when you're buying product, that's the most important thing. Buying good product is a number one, right? And trying to do research on the internet and all that, it's not as effective as going in person, meeting your vendors. Then when you have a question, you call them. When you want to reorder, they know you. I mean, to me, trade shows, whether I'd go to the Dallas market or I would go to the Las Vegas souvenir trade show or the Debbie Quintana's gift basket convention, trade shows and meeting people and your vendors is key, I think. And key because you understand the product better, you get more deals. Like, why do you feel that that's important? Well, I think all of the above. I think you go and they'll give you a shipping deal, if a show special, which is anytime you can save money on shipping, I am like, I hate paying for shipping. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> <It is. laughs> You're right. That's my pain point. And I think just making those connections, seeing what the trends are, seeing what's coming down the pike. I mean, those people, they're professionals. They're there to help you. And, you know, at first I'd be like, oh, I have to take three days off and go to the show and it's expensive and blah, blah, blah. But once you change your mindset of like, look, this is everything. It's your product. So if you don't have a good product on the shelves, it's not going to sell. It doesn't matter how pretty you make it look on the shelf. You got to have the product. So once I kind of got into the mindset of, all right, I need to really take time and This is step one. You can't miss step one. Can't miss step one. You're right. I'm also thinking, because I do trade shows a lot as well, that that connection that you get allows you to really understand what's behind a product from a way deeper level. 
just like you and I, how we're talking right now about your products, you understand the story and the history and you can talk to it with people who are in the shop and you know them more intimately, which makes a customer more interested in buying. It's, well, it's part of the experience of buying. If you know the guy who made it or the gal who made it or this person does this or they came from forever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's what brick and mortar is all about, the experience, right? I mean, you don't get that online. In our store here, it's an experience. It's not just when I hire people, I'm like, we're not 7-Eleven. We don't just check people out. We greet them and we welcome them and we're glad they're here and ask them about their why they're here or whatever. So brick and mortar should be an experience. Right. All right. So let's move into So El Paso. Did you start the store before you started the So El Paso brand? No. <laughs> okay. So you tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a company called El Paso Chili Company and they had salsas and kind of the same thing I'm doing. And they went bankrupt in like 08 and there was nothing that represented El Paso. And as you mentioned in our intro, El Paso's in the mountain standard time. We're not really Texas. We're not really New Mexico. We're not really... Mexico. I mean, we are our own little weird, unique, redheaded stepchild over here in the West Texas. It drove me crazy that there was nothing that really represented El Paso. You know, my friend was getting married and I wanted to give him something from his wife or his fiance, something from El Paso. And I, you know, I couldn't find anything. I'm like, someone needs to do this. And finally, I'm like, hey, why don't you do it? Who's that someone? <laughs> hey, dummy, why don't you do it? So I ended up I thought I was working for a personnel agency doing their marketing. And so I was only working 20 hours a week for them. So I started on the side and I went to the Dallas market and learned all I could about private labeling, which is a whole nother thing and the health department and doing it legally. I already had my LLC lined up, so I was good there. But then I had to come up with a logo and a name and a brand. And I had had my 30 year high school reunion and we kept laughing about things like going over to Mexico and drinking beer at age 15 or whatever. And we'd say, oh my gosh, that's so El Paso or going to the levee and having a bonfire. That's so El Paso. And we'd laugh because these people came from over back to El Paso. And they're like, that doesn't happen anywhere else. That's so El Paso. So it just kind of stuck to me that there is something unique about it. And I liked the name so El Paso. So Mm -hmm. started doing that. So the name came easy for the most part. Yeah, the name came pretty easy. And then the logo That was June. And then by December, I was kind of ready. And then March, I got a call from this local business newspaper, the El Paso Inc. And they're like, hey, we want to do a story on your products. I'm like, well, I'm not really ready. But I really didn't want another retail store because it's a lot of hours. And at Duck Duck Goose, I was the one. So like, oh, I went to your store and you weren't there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? I'm there like 23 out of 24 hours a day. So I really didn't want another retail store, but I just was going to do corporate gifts and that kind of thing. How did you get into product development and actually figuring out what was going to be different? Apart from the wording and the branding and all of that, what about the product? Well, that's kind of the funny thing of my whole career. When I was talking to someone the other day, I was like, I really didn't know how to use an Apple computer when I got a job there. I was dragging stuff to the trash, but it was just not in the trash can. It was all around the trash can. And someone said, why is this stuff all around your trash can? I'm like, oh, I'm throwing it away. No, you have to have the thing light up. I'm like, oh. I mean, I really didn't know how to use a computer. And I went to the next computer company. And then I worked for a software programming company. Well, I don't know how to program a computer. I don't know how to do my product anyway. I'm just more sales and marketing. So you can take already recipes that are already made and just private label them. Or you can take that and you can tweak them a little bit. There's different ways to do it. I haven't come up with anything all 100% my own. That's not my strong suit. So I know you have a lot of bakers and crafters and all that, and I'm sure they could do it, but that's just not my strong suit. So are you private labeling? Is that what you're doing? You're taking existing product and private labeling them, but it's all product then that still represents and has the feel and the vibe of El Paso. Right. Got it. And so what types of legal requirements are there? So you're not actually cooking in a kitchen or anything either. No. First, I thought it might be a weakness, but I watched, do you ever watch the show The Prophet with Marcus Limonis? Love him. Yeah, actually, you know, he's from my area. Oh like my he's, gosh. He's right too. here. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that show. Yeah, I, I'm not into manufacturing. I'm more sales and marketing and branding and that kind of thing. Okay, so this is really smart. So you took where you knew your skills already were, matched it with an opportunity that you saw in the market and something that you had been looking for. And I think that's a really good key to all of our listeners, too, when you said somebody should, anytime those words come out, you should turn the mirror and be like, hmm, is this an opportunity for me, (laughs) right? Right, yeah. 
Yeah, so I love this. So because then you're not dividing all of your attention then on production and all of that, you can really do sales and marketing where you already know that you excel. Was your first product then salsa? It was. It was salsa and then also a line of pecans. Mm-hmm. And when I went to Dallas to try to find some people, I got some really good advice. There was this guy, he makes, it's called Mojo something, I can't remember, but he wears this funny hat and he was like so nice. The whole cottage law doesn't work for me because I don't manufacture. He's like, you got to do this, you got to do this. He like gave me like a roadmap of how to private label stuff and how to not to get in trouble with the health department, that kind of thing. And I mean, I was just soaking it all in. Speaking of trade shows, it was at a trade show. People are very willing to help you. So yeah, that's where it kind of started with the pecans. And then I had a tortilla soup and then I had the salsas, which is obviously El Paso. And then it's kind of grown from there and I've added new things and, oh, we should have this. And this year we're going to add a chili con queso, a a jarred queso, which I'm really excited about. Ooh. Yeah. That one I tweaked because it wasn't hot enough. I'm like, we need more spice here. Come on, (laughs) spice it up, people. Right. But you're still not making that then. The whoever was your base for that is adding it in for you as your special brand. Correct. And then the other side of that also is that probably is not fun, but I have to have liability insurance. So I have to make sure whoever's manufacturing has liability insurance and I have to have liability insurance because if it comes back and someone gets sick or something, we both are responsible. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. So even if you're not actually making it, you still need to have liability insurance as well. That makes sense, though, because it's your label on the product. Correct. We're the first call. But I'm thinking the way you did this then allowed you to build products within your brand much faster. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. And I mean, most people do private label. I mean, there's very few people who create something in a big way. And then when I order, like I'm going to order this salsa or the queso, and it's going to be three pallets of queso. It's like, I don't have a manufacturing facility that could do all that. So I didn't want a retail store. And then I realized Christmas was coming and I needed someone to do a pop-up shop. Well, that's a lot of work. (laughs) So I thought, okay, well, let me just open a small store as like a showroom. And then we opened the small store, 1300 square feet in this old part of the neighborhood of El Paso, Kern Place. And people came in and they start asking for souvenirs. I'm like, what? (laughs) Do you have a snow globe? And then do you have a thimble? And do you have a t-shirt? And every day we'd laugh. Like my manager and I would just laugh. We're like, oh my gosh. I said, start writing this stuff down. So we started writing it down. And then I went to the souvenir trade show in Las Vegas. So now we're a souvenir store with also food items, which really wasn't ever the idea, but that's what we're doing. Well, but you got to listen to what people want, right? Yeah. And we meet people from all over the world. It's really a lot of fun to be kind of a ambassadors for El Paso. And so now we have a store. So what was the craziest thing? Because you certainly just because one person comes in and says they want something doesn't automatically mean you turn around and have it then. What was the absolute craziest thing that was asked for? I'm going to say the thimble because I didn't think people still collected thimbles. Mm. And then on the back of that is the spoon. I'm like, people really doing that still? <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> shot glasses, yes. <laughs> Thimbles and spoons, I don't know. <laughs> shot glasses, yeah, all day long. And then snow globes. I'm like, oh, good God, we live in the desert, people. Who needs a snow globe? Oh, good point. Yeah. And let me tell you, we have all three. You do? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So you ended up getting your small shop. Is your retail portion still that initial shop? Actually, when did you start the shop? Because you started So El Paso just product-based in 2015, right? Right. So that's only six years ago or five years ago at this point. So when did you start retail? So we launched in March of 2015, and then we moved into the store in September of 2015 to take advantage of the holiday shoppers. Oh, that very first holiday season. Okay, so you've been there for like five years, so you're in the same location that you started in. Yes. And so when you started your retail shop, how did you get the word out? Because now, remember, you're the sales and marketing person here, right? So how did you get people to know that you were there? More conversation about selling through a brick and mortar shop coming your way after this quick break. Yes, it's possible. Increase your sales without adding a single customer. How you ask? By offering personalization with your products. Wrap a cake box with a ribbon saying, happy 30th birthday, Annie. Or add a special message and date to wedding or party favors for an extra meaningful touch. 
Where else can you get customization with a creatively spelled name or find packaging that includes a saying whose meaning is known to a select two? Not only are customers willing to pay for these special touches, they'll tell their friends and word will spread about your company and products. You can create personalized ribbons and labels in seconds. Make just one or thousands without waiting weeks or having to spend money to order yards and yards. Print words in any language or font. Add logos, images, even photos. Perfect for branding or adding ingredient and flavor labels too. For more information, go to the ribbonprintcompany.com. Well, I had a little hiccup there. I hurt my hip. I tore my labrum in my hip. So I was on a walker from like April to August for my surgery. And then I moved into my store in September. And so I was on pain meds, sit up for six weeks. So I had a little hiccup there. I'd say. <laughs> basically word of mouth and like Facebook. I mean, at the time I was not in any position to be really fired up about doing anything. Yeah, this would be like the worst time to do it. Really, you could have so easily said, you know what, holidays, it would be a good idea, but this just can't happen this year, given that you weren't very mobile and in pain. And on pain meds. <laughs> and on pain meds. Well, maybe that's what led to the decision. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it was not the ideal situation. But but it's pretty incredible that you made the decision and just still did it. I think that's awesome. Was it the location you just really liked it and decided, okay, if I'm doing it, I've got to do it because I want this spot? Well, that, and it's a neat old town, old part of El Paso. It's kind of, it's a cute little, I used to buy, I used to shop in the center when I was young and buy my clothes. It was just a cute little location and the price was right. The landlord was willing to work with us and he's a great guy. And the other thing with private label is you have to have an address. You can't just private label and put PO box, whatever. So by law, you had to have an address. And I thought, you know, working out of like an office as my address, you know, it, it just wasn't right. So I thought, well, this is a good address, a good location. It was a three-year lease, which was very doable. And you already knew retail, so you really knew what you were getting into. Yeah, yeah. It didn't scare me. So what was your experience that first year, holiday season, I mean? You know, I kind of think we did the Junior League Fair that year, maybe. And we got some more exposure that way. We did pretty well. I don't remember. I wasn't really going after anybody. That was the problem because, like I said, I was a little under the weather. But to be honest, I don't really remember. Did you have people helping you, given that you were limited? I did. I hired one person, and she helped me out. And then I think we might have hired some, like a college student to help part-time. Then what really has helped is people would Google souvenirs, and then they would come in. So that when we started doing souvenirs, like, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. But honestly, Sue, I don't remember that first year. Okay, well, you get a pass because you were on pain meds. <laughs> Thanks. I give you kudos for just doing it because, like I was just saying, so many people would say, okay, it's not happening right now. Like, there's not a chance. But to your point of always trying things and taking action and seeing the big picture, you just went for it. So I think that's awesome. How has the progression of the shop gone from that point to today? Well, the store at the time was divided kind of in half longwise. So half of it was the retail and half was the back room. And the retail store, once we started doing souvenirs, just was too small. People couldn't get in and out and around and about. So we kind of had to bust out a little wall and put part of our back room as part of the retail store, which gave us a little more breathing room and a little more room to display things and that kind of thing. And then we started realizing that a $20 t-shirt is a lot more fun to sell than a $5 shot glass. So we started bringing in t-shirts and and Christmas ornaments and all that stuff. So we've really just been able to expand our souvenir section part of it because we have more room. Gotcha. And all this time you're also then doing wholesale. Kind of fell into the wholesale that had a friend of mine whose husband worked at the airport for Parodies, which runs the gift shops and like, hey, let's try your products. And so I very quickly got into the airport here, which was really cool. And then when I was in my old place, Whole Foods opened up in El Paso in 2016, October of 2016. And they came by and loved the salsa and it's local and Whole Foods is really good about promoting local. So I got into the Whole Foods, which I'm still in there. And that's a fun account. And then I got into uh, Total Wine here in El Paso, which is a big wine retailer. I don't know if y'all have those in Chicago, but mm -mm, no. there's like 100 or 225 stores nationwide. So I'm coming after you, Total Wine. <laughs> and then because we're kind of souvenir -y, I got involved with the hotel, the El Paso Hotel and Lodging Association, and I've got my 
products wholesaled into like the hotels here, like the Indigo and the Doubletree. And so in their little pantries or shops, I wholesale there too, which is also good exposure and good marketing. And people are like, who's this or what's this? So the wholesale side's kind of just been a kind of fell into my lap, thankfully, but it's been a fun part of the business as well. Do you think wholesale would have happened as it has to the extent it has if you didn't have that retail presence? Because so much of it, you're saying they came to you, they came to you. Yeah, probably not. Probably right. It all kind of, and I do a lot of networking and that stuff too. So that helps. And then the other thing is, which is really surprising, which is probably a good thing for people to hear is when Total Wine reached out to me about having my product in their store here in El Paso, because they were looking for local items. You know, the guy was very nice. He says, hey, I called him back. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a great opportunity. You got to jump on this. So I called him back and I'm working with him. And a couple of days into it, he's like, you know what? You're the only person that called me back. I was like, really? Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Which too bad for them, right? I mean, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I was getting into. We never even had a Total Wine. I mean, I knew what Total Wine was, but I was like, what the heck? It kind of goes back to that ask for forgiveness and permission thing. It's like, say yes and then figure it out, which drives my husband crazy because he's the figure out person. But I'm always like, yes, sure. Why not? It turned out to be great. I mean, we're now in Total Wine and they let me do some signage and that says local. And of course, I put my logo on it. It has a great east side presence because I don't have an east side retail store over there. So as opposed to the west side of El Paso. If someone calls you, call them back for crying out loud. Who cares? Yeah. And even if it's a little over your knowledge level at the time, like you're not sure exactly how to do it. There are so many ways to figure things out these days. It's so much easier now to do. And to your point, networking, I'm sure networking, that's how you got into the hotels and all that too. Connections, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So all of that is important for sure. I'm also kind of thinking that a smaller footprint for your retail shop makes you not as much a competitor first getting into some of these stores too. Yeah. And so I also price the wholesale items where we don't compete with each other. They can double their money and I can make my money and we, we're at the same price point. So it's not like I sell it for three to them and I sell it in my store for five ninety five, and they can do the same thing. So I don't ever want to compete with my retailers at all. Right. You're reading my mind because I was going to get into pricing because you started retail. Were you already at that price and you just saw that offering wholesale at that 50% approximately-ish was going to work? Or did you have to adjust your pricing at that point? No, it worked. And then, however, it doesn't work with all my products. So I will tell, I have a jalapeno bacon jam that I can't wholesale for, I guess we sell it for 10.95 or something. And I just say, hey, look, this is the wholesale price. I'm selling it for this. Either you, you can match my price or if you want to double, you're going to be more than me. So I'm just very upfront with them about this is something that either you don't make your margin and have the same price or you jack up the price and get your margin. So most of the things or everything else I have, they make their margin, I make my margins. And I do have people come to me and say, hey, I want you to carry this thing. And I say, okay, well, what is it? I say, what's my price? Well, your price is $10. Well, how much are you selling it for? 15. Well, I'm not going to take up room in my store for $5 margin. Right. I'd be more than happy to take it for $10 margin, And people don't get that because just because you have a store, every single space needs to be generating revenue, right? Every single inch is what you want. And so when they say that, like they get hurt. They're like, well, I can't sell it for 20. I'm like, well, (laughs) how can I sell it for 20? You're right. Not only that, but when you are providing so much value to the products that you're putting in your shop because people are coming into the store, they're associating it, even if it's not a complete So El Paso brand for that, it's related to your brand and all that you've built up in terms of what your reputation is and all of that. So it's more than just the price when they place their product in your store. Well, yes. And then I have an employee there every day. I have my lights on every day. I have my security system. I have my software. I have expenses. And I want to make sure that if I put it in my store, A, it's going to sell and B, it's something that we believe in. When you started doing wholesale, Because you're not producing, you didn't really have an issue of being able to run higher volume. No. Did any of your vendors have that issue? Did you come back to them? Did you see any challenges on that side? No. Lucky. All right. So so far, (laughs) Anne, I'm seeing you lucky on a bunch of points. You set your pricing right from the beginning. So it just was a natural, nice flow. You had no problem with being able to stock larger quantities. So that's awesome. Talk to me a little bit about where internet started fitting in, when that, when you started having an online presence and how that fits with everything else. 
So, of course, that was one of the first things you have to do is make sure that, that that's one of the hardest things these days is having a website name that someone hasn't taken. So before I even went forward with any of my branding, I made sure www.soelpaso.com was available. Do you mean like at the very start? At the very start. Got it. Agreed. And the dot .com, <laughs> not dot anything else. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, you got to be legit. So I did everything pretty much on the internet right away because I thought I was going to be doing corporate stuff and people could get on the internet and shop that way. And then I moved to Shopify for my store, which is the point of sale. And then Shopify makes it really easy to have the items. You just push a button, it goes on your website. However, since we're a souvenir store, people don't buy a lot on our website because you don't buy a Disneyland mug when you're at home. You buy it when you're in Disneyland. So our internet sales are not very big. Usually, I like to say that our internet is more like a selling tool instead of a sales tool because people will go online and go, oh, look, they have a thimble. Hey, I'm going to go. So it's more like a pre-selling. It's almost like a selling tool for me. Do you put all your products that are in the store also online then? The majority of them. We have some like Mexican like pottery that comes red tone or black tone. I don't do that. I don't put all that stuff. But anything that can be photographed, I would say 90% of the stuff is online. So yeah, our internet has gone up because of COVID and we now had to offer curbside pickup and we offer a local delivery now on our website. So we had to do a little tweaking for COVID, but internet's not that big a percentage of my sales. Okay. So your audience is really local people who love the products and then also people who are coming in to visit who want to take back a souvenir. Yeah, I would say the the 50% of my business is the retail store, which is tourist, and then 50% is wholesale and local. Got it. But I could also see that people who really like the salsas or those jams, because they're, as you're describing them, they're very unique flavors, right? So people who get it as a gift or bring it home then still have the opportunity where they can buy it again online. So that kind of fills that need there, if you will. Right. So we'll ship like our jalapeno pecan brittle, which is one of our best sellers, and we'll ship it to Virginia for a, a client. And then they'll call and say, we need 12 more. It's so good. But we can't wait for our Christmas gift because it's so different. And our sauce is damn good, Sue. I'm going to send you some. Okay, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to decline that offer for sure. <laughs> Where does gifting fit into everything here? I've seen you at the gift basket show. So clearly you're selling products to people who want to include your products in gift baskets. And you also have the hotel presence. So I'm just wondering overall how that category looks within the business. Well, that's the category I'm trying to grow because obviously people aren't traveling due to COVID and people aren't coming into our store as much. And I think there's a big push for El Paso being put on the map. There's a lot of great things happening. We actually had a bad thing happen when last August we had the infamous Walmart shooter. And then we had a bunch of immigration issues. So we've been on the map for a lot of different reasons. And of course, Beto O'Rourke. So we're on the map, but we just need to be a little more positive with everything we're doing and make sure everyone knows exactly what El Paso is all about. And so the local companies here, the local corporate clients I work with are very El Paso proud. So they want something that says El Paso, which is I'm thankful for because that was the whole idea. Right. And then I thought maybe, well, maybe I need to give them some other options like charcuterie or that kind of thing. And that's kind of what got me go to, to go to the National Gift Basket Convention. But then the more I think about it, we just need to push our own stuff. I mean, I like offering that other items, especially to our clients who are over and over. But it's funny because I opened it as a corporate gifting from the very beginning in 2015. And I've run through all this stuff. And now I'm kind of like, we need to get back there. So gifting is huge. And especially now when you can't see someone face to face to give someone a gift, either in the mail or delivered or whatever, it's a big deal. People aren't shaking hands. People aren't going to networking events. But how do you stay in front of these clients? Or how do you thank a referral? Right. And seriously, I mean, when you bring up the charcuterie boards, like all your products fit with that, the salsas and the jams and nuts. I could see like a box that's a So El Paso box and you open it up and you may even have it. I don't know. And then you have all that. And what great holiday gifts for people, even from El Paso to be sending. I mean, we're getting off of corporate gifts. I get that. But lots of opportunity there, I would imagine, for you. Yes, 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 yes. How else? Because you do have your skills in sales and marketing. How else would you suggest somebody who's like, this is my struggling point? Like, my product's awesome. I see people liking it. I'm just not getting in enough sales. What would you tell that person? 
I mean, for us, it's all about the experience when someone comes here because I think people, they talk about it. I have a great salesperson up front now and not even a salesperson. She's a greeter. She's not a seller. She's just nice to everyone. And people give us five-star reviews on Google. They've never been here. They come in, they leave, and they have a good recommendation for a Mexican restaurant or they have a recommendation for a day trip or something. We're more than just selling. I kind of laugh because I'm like, we don't just sling salsa here. We're trying to create an experience and an El Paso centric one. So I think just don't try to sell so hard. Just present your products and people will get it. And you know, the story, Sue, is so important always. The story, I mean, ours is branded with El Paso, so the story is pretty obvious. But I mean, for people that this is why I did it or this is how I did it. I mean, people love to hear that. You're not going to get that on your computer in your pajamas shopping on Amazon. You're just not. Right. You got to differentiate yourself from that. Amazon's always going to be there and Target and all that, but people want to know the story. You look at that, there's a picture and there's like a cup of coffee and a white thing and there's a cup of coffee in Starbucks. There's a cup of coffee, it's $1.50 and then Starbucks is $6. Branding. You got to find your brand and make it work because no one's going to do it for you. Your story is really important. The story really makes you unique and people then will support you because of that, because of whatever the story is. But the trick is you can't make up a story. Like it has to be real. Just like you were talking about at the beginning in terms of naming your name, like the fact that you with girlfriends, like you joke around, it's so El Paso. Like I could see you saying that. (laughs) And that leads directly into a fabulous brand. That just makes so much sense. You could do like promotional things like showing a product or something like that. That's so El Paso. You know, That could be like a whole theme. Oh, yeah. Love it. And it really sounds to me like when someone comes in the store, you're just being friendly. You're not hovering. You're not forcing a sale. People are going to look around, see what they like. You observe clearly what people are looking for, interested in, and you're listening. And then you kind of, not with everybody, I'm sure, but you accommodate what you're stocking accordingly to what people are looking for. Yes. That's the thing when you have a souvenir store that you're always getting new clients. So you can keep buying kind of the same thing over and over because they're different clients every day. Now, if you have a retail store in a small town, you're going to have to turn your items. You can't, if you sell six, don't buy 27 more because people who come into a local retail store want new and exciting. They want to come and support you in a new and exciting way. So our store is a little different because like I said, we are mostly tourists and every time they come, it's their first time. So I can go deep on items. Mm-hmm. But if you have a local retail store, you got to turn your, you know, just because it's, it's sold, that's great, but don't go too deep and tie up your money because you want to give them another reason to come in. And when they come in, oh, this is new or this is new. So there's two different kind of retail ways to look at it. Well, and to the point of going to market and seeing what's new and fresh too, because that's where you're going to find the new products to stock. Right. And get free shipping if you're lucky. And get free shipping. (laughs) (laughs) We all know how you roll with that for sure. (laughs) Anyone who wants something within Ann's stores, you got to have for free shipping, period. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, and and we get beat up on this end because shipping is expensive and we don't put it into our price. And people are like, why is shipping so expensive? I'm like, well, we don't hide it in our price. Because it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't make money on shipping. It's just a pass through for us. So that's one of the hardest things about being a small vendor is that we can't compete. It's like, this is the price. And if you walk in, that's the price. We're not going to doctor it, you know, cook it with shipping. Right. Do you ever offer sales on product? Not very often. I'm just not a big believer in that. When I had my furniture store, the, the man, his name's Jack Delaney. He owns a company called El Paso Import here. He said, don't ever discount. He said, give something free. Give something of value. Add on. Don't reduce your price. Yeah. Because some guy might buy $10,000 worth of furniture and you gave him a deal and the other guy buys one end table and wants a deal. So we would say, we'd throw in, hey, why don't you pick a lamp that you like? And this $90 lamp, they value at $10,000 because, oh my gosh, this is such a great gift. So I've always had his, my words of wisdom in my back. Like I'd rather add value than decrease the value of my product. Right. I priced it fairly. Really, what I love about your whole business model is you have revenue coming in from different places. You have the retail shop, you have wholesale, multiple places, not just one place. And you do have internet, albeit it's a smaller portion. But all of them together as an overall package, if you will, makes everything stronger. Because people might buy in your shop and then go into Whole Foods in three weeks and be like, oh my gosh, I can get it here too. 
so you're able to play one off another and they all become stronger for it. Yeah, the products are marketing the products for me. <laughs> when I put the product, when I place the products, they're marketing. Exactly. So corporate is your future vision, corporate gifts. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that and also I've created another line called Zero Miles that I'd like to do regionally specific local foods. So I just pitched the airport. So hopefully they'll come back with me. Because when you go to an airport, there's not a lot of local foods. I'm working on that angle. Okay, so back this up so my mind can wrap around this. So Zero Miles is going to be a new brand. Yes. And say again what it is. So I have So El Paso, and my vision was always to do like So Midland, So Dallas, So Phoenix. That was always my vision with the line. But you can't really protect that name because you can't protect the name of a city as far as the trademark goes. Mm -hmm. So I had this thought, I'm like, I need to have a new brand. And it's so it's like Houston is zero miles or Phoenix is zero miles. And it's a new brand and I can put product in, in any area. So I could put peanuts in Georgia or I could put Cajun mix in Louisiana or I could put whatever. So I could take that whole brand and I can also protect that as zero miles. I've got, I'm working on doing the trademark for that. And then that would be something where, that it's local, it's regional, but it's also got the flavors, but it's also got the name. So I'm actually working with someone in Nashville right now. You might know her. And we're going to do a line of Nashville items for her so she can put them in her gift baskets. So people love their visiting. They want something for their dog sitter. They want something for their mother-in-law. And food is perfect because food, no one needs any more symbols. Well, they do. But no one really needs any more thimbles. <laughs> they really don't. Like, could we just say, like, no more thimbles? <laughs> I agree with you there. <laughs> Some of our needlepoint people, though, are not going to be happy with us. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we sell them. We can get you one. But the thing that's so great about consumable products, though, is that's a gift that you can give over and over again. Right. Well, and our bags are resealable, so you can pop it open and then you seal it back up and throw it in your suitcase or whatever. So that's the vision. I love it because I could really see like zero miles in all different locations with products Good. that are from that location. That makes so much sense to me. And you become known as that. And I mean, think of how broad, man, that is huge. I love that. How did you get this idea? Well, because the airport has, well, Parodies is the name of the company and they have like 125 airport stores around the country. And the buyer said, hey, can you do something for Midland? I buy from the Midland airport. So we changed it to So Midland, and we put a little Texas flag on it, a little oil rig. And it was the same products, but it was So Midland. And I was like, oh. But the hard part is getting in these places. So I'm already in. How can I bring more of that into something bigger? Makes so much sense. So you'll still keep the So El Paso, but then you'll oh, yeah. also have zero miles for other locations. Correct. Got it. Yeah, because how could you let go so El Paso? <laughs> like, you just can't. <laughs> That's so great. My child. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This has been so much fun learning. The overall observation here is you have ideas and then you act. You put it into play. When do you predict we'll see something zero miles out? I'm ready. I sent the email to the airport people Wednesday, just two days ago. So we'll see. Okay, but if you really want to know, you might be able to help me. I want Marcus Limonis to put this in his Camping World locations. That could be awesome. There you go. Well, I've got my eye on him because secretly I would love to interview him for the show if he'd be willing. I mean, we are kind of like hometownish people, but you never know. So we put it out there, Anne, and see what happens. I'm putting it out there every day. It's all the law of attraction. So let's go for it. You and I both. <laughs> okay. If you get in, we'll piggyback. Okay. Works for me. <laughs> all right. Well, Anne, this has been so much fun. So now all of us as listeners are going to be on the lookout now for zero miles. No pressure, Sue. No pressure. <laughs> Coming to an airport near you, we just all have to be flying again. That's the thing. Exactly. Because I was ready to make this happen. Then COVID hit. And I'm like, oh, no. So that was not good. It'll happen. We'll be there. We'll be back soon. Oh, I'm yeah. really confident that that's true. Yeah, no pressure, Sue. I should put it out there. I'm putting it out there. Put it out there for sure. All right. Well, listen, I'm so excited to track what you do, watch you grow. You are a woman on the move without question. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Sue. I really, really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. 
Wasn't Anne's story inspiring? Apart from all the obvious information about private labeling, what I really want you to take away from this is the power of connections. They allowed Anne to get product placement in stores she couldn't even believe. It also led her to understanding specifically what her customers wanted, so she ensured that they would buy when they walked into her store. Not just souvenirs, but thimbles and spoons. Talk to your customers, listen to what they say, attend networking meetings, and make connections in all areas of your life. You just never know where they may lead. Thanks for spending time with me here today. If you'd like to show support for the podcast, I'd love it if you would leave a rating and review. That means so much and helps the show get seen by more makers. A great way to pay it forward. And now, be safe and well, and I'll see you next week on the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. I want to make sure you're familiar with my free Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. It's a place where we all gather and are a community to support each other. I've got a really fun post in there that's my favorite of the week, I have to say, where I invite all of you to share what you're doing, to show pictures of your product, to show what you're working on for the week, to get reaction from other people, and just for fun because we all get to see the wonderful products that everybody in the community is making my favorite post every single week, without doubt. Wait, what? Aren't you part of the group already? If not, make sure to jump over to Facebook and search for the group Gift Biz Breeze. Don't delay. Come join us in Gift Biz Breeze. Today, 